so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you How marvelous, how wonderful you are, beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one my soul must sing, beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one. Captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you You opened my eyes to your wonders anew You captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one I love Beautiful one I adore Beautiful one, my soul must sing. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. Good morning. It is a beautiful morning this morning, is it not? Not quite as much as Key West was last week. Some of you didn't even miss me. Hey, we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, especially glad as always to have visitors and guests with us to both our members and our guests alike. We encourage you to fill out the white card that's either in the pew or in your program this morning. Put that in the collection plate later and we will have a record of your attendance and we would love to have that. Also this Sunday, big news. I don't know if you noticed, a little bit behind on the contribution this year. So we've selected today as a time to make up that contribution. But please remember that if you forgot or didn't, this is not the only day you can make up your contribution. You can do that next week and the next week and pretty much any week you want to for as far as we can see. But please try to help us get that back up so that we can continue to do all the good ministries that we want to do. This morning, also glad to have, lost my notes, Dr. Earl Lavender with us. Presently from Lipscomb University where he's been preaching, teaching since 1990. Um, he has served as the Director of Missional Studies and as a professor in the College of Bible and Ministry. He also teaches adjunctly for Abilene Christian as well as a visiting professor for Pe Pepperdine and Oklahoma Christian. Um, he has been involved in mission and ministry efforts across Europe, Australia, India, Russia. He is an accomplished author and a contributor to uh, many commentaries, co-authored a book with Gary Holloway, and an all-around really good guy, mostly. Married to Rebecca Nance of Nashville, he has three children and five grandchildren, and you will be blessed to be here this morning, and we get him again later in the year, so if you, if you really love it, you can come back and hear him again later on in the year, but we're really glad to have Dr. Lavender here. Thank you, Dr. Lavender, for being with us. And now, if you would stand and greet someone around you, and we'll continue in just a moment.
Oh, the Lord, our strength and song, highest praise to Him belong. Christ the Lord, our conquering King, Your name we raise, Your triumph sing. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By His hand we stand in victory, and by His name we overcome. Though the storms of hell pursue, in darkest night we worship You. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so grateful to be in your house this morning. Lord, please prepare our hearts. Please open our minds to hear your word, but to not only hear it, to, to be truly affected by it. Lord, we dedicate this worship to you. We pray that it's pleasing to you. We pray that it honors you. Lord, we've been blessed here at our church to have a very capable very godly leaders. Please be with them. Please give them guidance and wisdom as they direct the future of our church. And be with us as a congregation and to help support them in any way we can. Lord, we know that this is your earth and, and everything in it belongs to you. Um, help us to be mindful stewards of the gifts that, that you've given us. And help us to be as gracious to you as you are to us. And finally, Lord, we, we just thank you for this country and the ability to worship you freely without fear of persecution. Lord, pray for our nation. Um, our nation was built on, on certain rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. 
but instead of the pursuit of happiness, let us as a body of believers try to pursue holiness instead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we consider our sermon this morning, missional fruit of inward devotion, I hope you'll give your thoughts to these songs about worshiping from the heart. Merciful Savior, gracious Redeemer, slow in your anger, rich in your love, full of compassion, longing to heal and bless. You will forgive all of my sin if I will confess. Here is my heart, Lord, I lay it open. Search every corner, cleanse every heart. Here is my heart, Lord, yielded and broken. Merciful Lord, come and restore. Here is my heart, merciful Savior, gracious Redeemer, slow in your anger, rich in your love, full of compassion, longing to heal and bless, you will forgive all of my sin. If I will confess, here is my heart, Lord, I lay it open. Search every corner, cleanse every part. Here is my heart, Lord, yielded and broken. Merciful Lord, come and here is my heart. You make beautiful things. All this pain, I wonder if I'll ever find my way. I wonder if my life could really change at Life is being found in you. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. You make me new. You are making me new. You
I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Let's take our offering. Sweet adoration flows from your children. Glory and honor and praise are a part of our constant devotion. Love set in motion for the divine one who reigns in our hearts. Sweet adoration flows from your children. Glory and honor and praise are a part of our constant devotion, love set in motion for the divine one who reigns in our heart. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walk, the long dusty roads, and the hill to the cross. How beautiful is the body of Christ. How beautiful the radiant bride who waits for her with his light in her eyes. How beautiful when humble hearts give the fruit of your lives so that others may live. How beautiful is the body of Christ. And as he laid down his life, we offer this sacrifice that we might live just as he died, willing to pay the price, willing to pay the price. How beautiful the feet that bring the sound of good news and the love of the King. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful. I was trying to think of uh, a thought for this moment. I, I thought back a little bit to, to last week, and I want to thank uh, Daniel Shepard for sharing the story of his grandfather's knife. But I, uh, 
the more I thought about that, I thought about a knife that was given to me as a gift that was my great-grandfather's. And I showed it to Daniel, and it's much the same shape of being well used. And along those lines, I thought of, of imitation. Uh, this is not necessarily an imitation of Daniel, but I am uh, uh, sharing some of the, the same, same thought. Uh, when Kim and I got married as gifts to our, our groomsmen, I gave out pocket knives. I don't know, some kind of family tradition or something, but uh, I gave one to my nephew Drew, who at the time was 14, and kind of as a turnabout, uh, he turned around and gave, gave Michael one when he was a ring bearer for his own wedding. Michael was three. <laughs> I don't know that that was all thought out properly, but uh, in following a family tradition or imitation, uh, it, it came through. But uh, along those lines, what do we think of when we are imitating others? Who do we imitate in our lives? Um, Brought to mind a number of scriptures, but I thought, do we, do we use that to, to aid others? Do we use that to imitate Christ's example? Or do we uh, choose others in the world around us or, or even biblical figures to imitate? In John 13, 4 and 5, so he got, down from, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had wrapped himself. Are we that kind of servants to our friends, to our fellow uh, Christians, to those that we reach in our community? Who do we imitate? I also thought in terms of uh, Peter, the rock that that uh, Jesus said he would build his church on. And as solid as Peter turned out to be, there was a moment when he was uh, less than someone to imitate. In Luke 22, verses 60 and 61, Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today you will disown me three times. Who do we imitate? At this time, as we gather together, we, we have an opportunity to imitate the example that Jesus left for us. Communion is an imitation of, of Jesus and the pattern he left. Mark 14, verses 22 through 24, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said that to them and then partook of a feast that would, would come to symbolize the death that he was preparing for. And from then there was the the all-powerful resurrection and uh, the chance we have to, to imitate him but also to remember that life, that death, and that resurrection. Will you pray with me? Dear Father, thank you so much for giving your son for the sacrifice that he made here on this earth to come down to live as a man but also to, to give his life to give his body, to give his blood. We thank you so much for that resurrection and, and what it symbolizes to our lives and uh, to the eternal life that we have through him with you. And through your son's name we pray these things. Amen.
Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw. Join me in prayer once again. Most, most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you today, to gather around this table to commemorate your son, his death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you so much for the blood that he spilled. May we partake of this fruit of the vine and do so remembering that that terrible sacrifice, but one that was necessary for our spiritual life. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
blessing to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, we will be working out of John 15. We've already had that wonderful reading this morning, and we'll continue to talk about that as we study God's Word together. It's a blessing to be with you. I've known of Twickingham from a distance for quite a while. It's good to finally be here, and already your worship this morning has been really edifying and, and strengthening in many ways, so I'm glad to be a part of leading your thoughts. Uh, one of the things that I'm involved in I, as I direct missional studies is I work with churches literally all over the world. In the last three years, I've been on all six inhabited continents. I don't have any interest in Antarctica. Penguins are known to be less than receptive. Um, but working with churches in terms of what their responsibility in the kingdom of God is. And the opportunities that we have as children of God to be rescuers in a world that desperately needs to hear the true story of life. Uh, I've had the opportunity to lead several of you in thoughts and times that you've been at Lipscomb. And you know that one of the things um, that I talk an awful lot about is that as we go th into the world, I think sometimes we fail to realize that there is this universal question in terms of, you know, what is the purpose of my life? And the question of why am I here? Uh, I teach a class in the spring called Faith and Culture, which used to be called apologetics. Um, it's the idea of how do you defend your faith in culture? And one of the things I want my students to understand is that everybody has faith in something. Everyone in some way, shape, or form has built their life around certain ideas. Um, and and the sociologists sort of help us with this when they talk about the fact that each of us live in two stories simultaneously. Well, the first story is called a first order story. And uh, really, to be an effective teacher, you need to be aware of the first order stories that your students bring. First order just simply means the story that's most intimate to you. And so each of you, in some way, shape, or form, each of you are following a sense of a storyline that is your personal story. 
And you can have an identical twin and you're still going to have different first order stories. This is what gives you your name. This gives you your identity. And it's going to affect how you hear what I have to say this morning. You bring that with you. But no one lives alone in their first order story. Everybody has what's called a second order story, uh, which is, in a sense, your functioning faith. Now, I, th I think it's really important for you to recognize that everybody has faith in something. Now, I've actually had students stand up in this class and say, Professor Lavender, I, I, I'm sorry, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I am not a believer in anything. And I say, a contraire, mon ami. That's my only French phrase, but I use it quite often. You do believe something. By you saying you don't believe anything, that's still a system of faith. I said, I have five grandchildren. You're going to have to explain to me why those little globs of flesh are so meaningful. If there is no meaning in life, then explain how there's beauty in music and beauty in the natural world that we look in. And this is not something absent of design. And so even a person who says, I don't believe anything, that in and of itself is a functioning faith. So understanding that, how do people make a choice? How do they decide really what they want to be? Well, they live in the story that makes the most sense of their life. And I'll tell you this morning that one of my great concerns in working with people of faith is not for those who do not know God's story, but for believers who choose not to live into God's story. And again, I'm not making an accusation here. I'm just observing churches that I've been able to work with in terms of what does it mean to live in the story of God? And you could ask the question, what does this have to do with Luke 15? And I think that Luke 15 is one of the many texts that we could use to talk about how important it is for us to recognize the content and the, and, and the importance of the life into which we live. You know, there's a, a disturbing text in Luke 13. We won't read it this morning, but I want to refer to it and, and offer you the, to read the text. Do you remember what happens here is that the disciples are walking in, in, in together and one of them says, hey, uh, Lord, we, got, we have a tough question for you. Um, what, what was it about those Galileans who were offering a sacrifice uh, and Pilate came in and just slaughtered them? Who, who, you know, who was sinful in that situation? In other words, they were asking what terrible thing had they done to deserve such an end? And what Jesus says is a little bit disturbing. He says, what about this one? What about those eight fellows that were walking by the Tower of Siloam and the tower just fell on them and killed them? What about that? See, the first one, at least, you have Pilate, who was an evil man, a violent man, slaughtering, apparently, pilgrims of faith. So you see the evil of humankind against humankind, you can understand that. But what Jesus says is, what about these people that are just walking by the tower, and the tower fell on them? And then he said something, and it doesn't sound very nice. He said, I tell you that unless you repent, something worse will happen to you. You say, Jesus, are you having a bad day? I mean, come on, what we were asking is, who was at fault? We didn't want you to indict us. And then Jesus told a parable, as he often did. And that's the text that I'm referring to here in verses 6 through 9. It's a parable of a, of a vine that's planted in a vineyard, and it's not producing anything. And in this parable, you have the owner of the field, and then you have the one who's tending the field. And the tender of the field says, he says, this vine's not producing anything. The owner says, cut it down burn it. It's not worth the ground that it's taking up. And, Jesus, or the, and the tender, who clear, clearly here would be Jesus, said, no, I'll tell you what, let me fertilize around this plant. Let's wait another year, and then if it doesn't produce anything, we'll throw it away. Now, what's the meaning of that? Well, it's pretty clear that what Jesus is saying is the meaning of your life, the purpose of your life, is that God created you to bear fruit. I talked this morning with a class about this idea of a theology of creation, that your life means something because you're a part of God's creation. He has created you, like everything else, to produce something for the good of others. This is the purpose of life. And what Jesus is saying is if you're spending your life for something other than God's purposes, then repent. Become a part of what God is doing because life is fragile. Take full advantage of what life means. And so Jesus is inviting us into this idea that the reason that God created us is so that we might bear fruit for the sake of the glory of God. Fruit specific to what God created you to be. Now the reason I think this is so important, again I talked to the, a class this morning about that, uh, what I would love to see happen at Twickingham, I know you're in a time of transition, but it seems to me that one of the most underutilized resources in the world are those of you who are here this morning who don't really feel like they're a part of what God is doing in the world. I don't know that that's your fault. I think historically as we have allowed the church to develop, we have turned it into, a, unfortunately, a performer 
and then spectators who come to have their needs met, but not necessarily to be redirected into the purposes of God in the context of their everyday lives. What I love doing at Lipscomb is I love teaching at a a liberal arts school where tomorrow I have an eight o'clock required Bible class. Again, greatest challenge in the history of education, right? Monday morning, eight o'clock required class. I have students coming in at seven o'clock to make up a makeup test. I'll teach them to miss a test. All right, so anyway, I'll have these 40 students studying the story of Jesus and quite a few of them are not believers or they haven't ever been to church or, you know, I'll have about half my class will be either from Churches of Christ or strong religious backgrounds, but a lot of our students are coming to Lipscomb just simply because they want a good education. What an opportunity. I have 45 hours to convince them that Jesus is Messiah. And I'm about halfway through the, the Gospel of Luke, and I've already had three or four of them that are not believers come, and we've, we've started studies. It's just it's an amazing opportunity. But what I want them to find out is in this exploration of, of finding out what vocation they're going to pursue, that just because they choose not to pursue ministry and they're pursuing some other of the colleges that we offer, that they're no less involved in the purposes of God. That bearing fruit is not specific to religious activities, that everything that we're called to be in our lives is to demonstrate the Creator who has given us the opportunity to partner with Him in bearing fruit for the good of others. This is the way of Jesus. And so what I want us to challenge, to challenge us to think about this morning is What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And that Jesus came to give us life. That Jesus came to to truly resolve the tension that uh, exists between the sinfulness of humanity and to move that separation from God's purposes. I think too often we think about Jesus as coming as some kind of personal spiritual savior that leaves our lives unimpacted by his purpose. And I'm convinced that Jesus came to do what God is most concerned with and that is recovering all of creation to his purposes. And it's not just a spiritual message. It includes everything that we are. And so we have this opportunity to recognize that Jesus came to redeem our lives, to return them to their intended purpose, which I talked to you before as as being a theology of creation. That's not necessarily a religious term. I'll often ask my students, when you hear the word redeem, what do you think of? And they'll tell me about this sort of transaction in the sky where God forgives us of our sins. I say, but what kind of impact is that supposed to have on our life? What does it mean to be redeemed? And here's the word means to bring something back to its intended purpose, to buy something back. So God created us to bear fruit in every aspect of our life for the good of others. This is the way of Jesus, because that's what God created us to do. And so it troubles me that some of us would believe that God would save us to leave us in our self-focused, unredeemed kind of life. (coughs) Excuse me. God wants to redeem every aspect of our life. And so Jesus came as the exact representation, the image of God, which is what we were also created to be. And we're called to be Jesus' apprentices in the school of abundant life, becoming that which God intended. (coughs) Excuse me, working with allergies. Um, So let me do something here, a little unusual. I want to overlay the story of the rich young ruler over what I think is the heart of the gospel. I just worked, I've got two sections of the story of Jesus, and we just worked through this text uh, in uh, this week. And the first climax of all three of the Gospels that are similarly organized, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus does these amazing things. He raises the dead. He calms the sea. He does, he he gives life back to to, uh, the young man who's uh, who's died, gives gives him back to his mother. Uh, He, he, restores the paralytic. It's it's amazing what Jesus does. And then Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And for some reason, people aren't willing to call him Messiah because he's not saying what they think he should say. But of course, Peter says, you are Messiah. And Jesus says, okay, let me explain what that means. It means that if you would follow me, you must deny yourselves. Now, you know, again, what does that look like? What does it mean to deny ourselves? And what I want my students to understand is it doesn't mean to negate the value that your life represents. It's not that at all. It means to deny the ego that would cause you to take the talents and gifts that you have and use them for yourself. So you have a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, good teacher, tell me what I must do to have eternal life. Now understand that the question that he's asking, he's not asking what I have to do to go to heaven when I die. That's not the question of the Jews. 
The question is, how do I live the full life for which God created me, which they would have understood to be messianic life? And what the rich young ruler is saying to Jesus is, I see in you the life that I want. Tell me how to get there, good teacher. And Jesus says, I'm not going to play word games with you. Don't call me good. Only God is good. Because likely what that teacher wanted, that young, young ruler wanted, was a soft answer. And Jesus says, there's no soft answer to this. So he says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. To the rich young ruler, he made this specific application because the rich young ruler thought he was religious. And Jesus said, you need to sell all your stuff. Now, what I'm suggesting this morning, if we're going to be fruitful for God, we need to hear the challenge of Jesus to quit misusing the gifts that God has given us only for ourselves. Because fruit doesn't eat itself, it's to be eaten by others. That's the point, is that we are to produce something for the good of others. But as long as we're not denying self, we're going to just simply take that which we have been given, use it for ourselves. And Jesus says, that's not the way of life. If you want to follow me, get the ego out of the way. And then he says, pick up your cross. Now, that's not a negative statement. It's a way of life. He's basically saying, take that which you have and make it available to others. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, which would have meant I am here for you. I will pay the ultimate price for you. For the rich young ruler, give your stuff to the poor. But the invitation to the rich young ruler wasn't sell your stuff, give it to the poor, and you'll find life. He says, get rid of that which distracts you so that you can follow me. That's the invitation. Come and follow me. And so that's our challenge this morning. We have been, in challenge, we have been invited, challenged, to submit our life to the one who created us for his glory. And we've come around the table this morning not to celebrate what God has done for us, but to remember what God has done for us so that we can become that for others. We come together for the purpose of becoming that which God gives us. We take bread to become bread. We come to eat of God's fruit so that we might become fruit for those who are in the world. And so we have this amazing opportunity, but you know, how do we do this? And that's where we get to our text. And I'd love to spend a lot more time in this and can't this morning, but I want to work through this, the idea that's presented in John 15. Let me tell you two concerns I have as we get into the, this text and specifically here talk about the gracious invitation of Jesus in John 15. I have two main areas of focus in being director of missional studies at Lipscomb. I've spent with my wife most of our life, about half of it now, in planting churches and being involved in missions. So I direct missional studies for that reason. But I've also been very involved in spiritual formation. I founded the Institute for Christian Spirituality at Lipscomb. And there's an interesting intersection there. In my experience, missions has greatly suffered because it has not been strongly spiritually formed in many places. We have a heart for mission, but it's not very theologically informed. And so we'll go out and do missions for a while and then leave, and then those things fall apart. I've seen that happen over and over again. On the other hand, I've also seen spiritual formation that is almost self-therapy. It looks like spiritual formation for the sake of feeling better about myself. And what I think is that any kind of spiritual formation or spiritual disciplines, I don't know if you know people like this, they practice the spiritual disciplines, they're very involved in prayer and scripture study, and somehow they develop a slightly English accent, which in the South is really weird. But all they want to talk about is their own spirituality. Here's what I suggest. Any kind of spiritual formation that does not end in missional living is not authentically Christian. In other words, the more you study scripture, the more you're involved in practices such as meditation and contemplation and prayer, the more you find yourselves being available to those who need what you have to give. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So I'm very interested in this intersection of the spiritual disciplines and the missional call of God for us to be those people that God called us to be. And that's why this text is so important. Because what John 15 calls us to, the key phrase in John's gospel is that Jesus says, I can do nothing apart from my Father. Now, in philosophical terms, I can say this is not an ontological choice, meaning it doesn't mean that Jesus is saying, I cannot do anything unless God tells me to do it. I think some of us have an idea that Jesus was almost tied to God in such a way that he could only do what God said. But Jesus here is talking about a choice in his full humanity that he makes daily. He is going to choose to live in such a way that he can do nothing apart from what would uh, deepen the purposes of his Father. This is a choice that he invites us into. And so what I want us to understand is that the statements made in John 15 are not religious statements. 
Jesus wants to rescue and redeem our lives, every aspect of them, that we are what God created us to be. We're a part of his creative plan. So, what is the key to this? What is the key to life? And it is what John tells us, as we've heard in our reading this morning already, we've got to be connected to the vine. That's the key. That's the key to every one of you here this morning. And my prayer is, whatever direction Twickingham goes in now in this time of transition, that you, I know that you're committed to this idea, but until all of us are intimately connected to the vine, none of us can live. Not fully. This is what Jesus invites us to. And we have to be intentionally connected deeply to the purposes of God or we can't fully live. So if I ask the question, who is your hero? Who is the one that you think really has life as it ought to be lived? And I would suggest that probably this morning we would all say Jesus because we're in church. But your hero is the person who you find yourself often dreaming to be. Or whatever that might be, whatever objective in your life you might have that takes up your passions and takes up your fantasy life, if you will, what you think about in terms of wanting to aspire. And if it's other than Jesus, I think C.S. Lewis has it right, that our problem is not that we want so much, that we're, but we're satisfied with so little. So here's what happens. When you have a life that's connected to Jesus, it is absolutely going to bear fruit, and it's going to bear much fruit. But apart from him, what we have to understand, we can do nothing. So the truth is, if we're not producing fruit, we're not living. Now I'll tell you, and you know this to be true, there are people that you know who are not necessarily followers of Jesus, but they figured this out. They've become very altruistic, they've become very giving, very generous. And we have an opportunity to give them an understanding as to why that's so fulfilling. I've had the opportunity to bring several people to faith who are adamant non-believers, only to have them discover that the song of life that they hear within their head is the song of Jesus. I wish I had time to tell you those stories. But we act as interpreters to help them understand why giving away feels so good. And it's because God created us for that. And that doesn't make us right with God, but it does give us a sense but that's what life is for. And then you let them see what Jesus came to do in terms of giving us life. Okay, my real concern, though, are those of us who claim Jesus as our Messiah, but we're not necessarily living to bear fruit for others. We've embraced a different kind of life, and we've got to understand that until we see our lives in the context of God's purposes, where we're giving ourselves away, then we can't really enjoy the life for which we were created. Now, there's a, there's a key word in John 15 that I want to spend a little bit of time on. In the NIV that we read this morning, it's translated as dwell, which is a little bit, I think, a little bit less focused than the word ought to be. The word is abide. In, in Greek, the word is meno, and I don't talk about Greek much except when it means something uh, important. And this is what we call a marker word in Greek. That is, when you see the word, it sort of hits you. You pay attention to it. And so the word abide, that's translated as dwell again, the NIV, is a very intense word. It's intentional in every way. So that when we abide in something, it demands every aspect of our life. And we remain loyal to it until death. And you think about this. I, I confessed in class this morning, I am a recovering sports addict. Emphasis recovering, okay? I still get carried away too much in it. But isn't it interesting how we can abide in a certain team of players we don't, don't know playing a game we do not play, spending all of our passions there abiding in something that ultimately gives us little or nothing? So I think Satan's really good at taking the capacity that God has given us for passion and misdirecting it toward things that ultimately leave us dissatisfied. Because even if your team wins the championship, how long does that thrill last? I mean, the day after the championship, they're talking about next year. But that gives us a taste of what it means to participate in something that we feel good about that leaves us empty. There's a better story. We can abide in the purposes of Christ so that it, it is everything that we are. And if we abide in Christ, then these other stories are not going to invade our loyalties. And abiding is where we spend our passions. So where do you spend the most of your passions? Where do you find yourself making financial sacrifices in order to participate. And then you think about how easy it is for us to get distracted from those things which are really important. <coughs> so let's think about again, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? 
Where does our mind abide? Where does it go for pleasure? And where our mind abides is where our true second order story is. And that's the challenge that we have. To redirect our life toward that which is the purpose and the focus of our life. I had an opportunity this summer that was really unusual. It's the several times I've had this, but I, I, I was born and raised in Italy, and so Italian is still my, my first language, and I have the opportunity of working back in Italy and, and do work there. There's a Bible festival that's actually put on by the Catholic Church, and they've invited me. My, my doctoral work is in early church history, and I did my, my doctoral work at St. Louis University, which is a Catholic school. And so they invite me as a Catholic scholar to make a presentation at this large international festival. And this year, what they talked about was the story of Jesus. So they invited me to come and finish out that festival with a talk on Tell Me the Story of Jesus. It's the most fun I think I've had in a long time. Three or four hundred people, many of whom were just sort of traditionally Christian, very few who were adamant Christians, and sharing with them the story into which they could abide, giving them a sense of where their life could be spent, and in particular challenging them with Paul's words in Romans chapter 8, where he basically says, you have two choices. You can either walk according to the flesh or you can walk according to the Spirit of God. And if you're walking according to the Spirit of God, then you're going to be living in such a way that God is glorified by how you live. And then just asking the question, how many of you want to live in that life where every day is meaningful? I'm not saying easy. I'm saying meaningful and purposeful. That you have an opportunity to wake up into the reality of walking with the very Spirit of the Creator and so you have a way of practicing the ways of Jesus. Now what I'm going to do next, I'm going to have to do very quickly, but I want to talk to you about something I've been doing with my classes lately. I'm going to come back to that story in just a moment. But in my uh, Christian apologetics course, I, I, I split my classes into what are called Jesus dojos. And I don't know if any of you have seen the book by Mark Scandrett. But basically what he says is, put the teachings of Jesus to the test. And so for years and years, I taught this Christian apologetics course and would have my students make a presentation at the end of the semester as to what's the best reason for believing in God. And my students would do some amazing things. But it was interesting to me that non-believers weren't coming to faith just talking about the amazing reasons we should believe in God. So I started instead dividing them into dojos. And what these are, that's the Japanese word for a place of practicing the martial arts. And Mark Scandrett says, try to practice the ideals of Jesus. You know, live in the teachings and actions of Jesus in community and hold one another accountable so that things like integrity, love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control, humility, forgiving, life sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 and 2, living in the ways of Jesus, uh, learning not to worry. And the interesting thing is putting students in for a semester where believers and non-believers together in groups of seven practice the ways of Jesus, which I would suggest is a way of abiding in Jesus. And what I challenge them to do, I say, we're a research university. Put the teachings of Jesus to the test. They're either true or not true. And without exception, in the four or five years I've done this now, besides bringing many students to faith, none of them have had a negative response to what Jesus says about life. And what happens when we abide in the ways of Jesus, we find out that what he says about life is true. And we begin to gain new insight about our lives in the context of his love. And so, surrendering then to the guidance of the Holy Spirit you do it by saying, I can do nothing apart from the Father. That's what I'm challenging us to think about this morning. That if we abide in the purposes of God through our study and through our prayer, that we look at these spiritual disciplines as sort of the centering experience of life, that we're dedicated to Bible study, dedicated to prayer, to meditation on the purposes of God, contemplation on how we're living in the purposes of God, fasting, living life as a sacrificial death for the sake of others. And I want you to see that your life is an artistic expression of God's creativity that can only happen when you intentionally abide in Him. Let me share a couple of things with you as we come to a conclusion, and then I want to finish my other story. What I really want to do this morning is just challenge you to see the value of your life in producing fruit that the world so desperately needs, and nobody's excluded from this picture. Uh, I want to share with you some works that in my Story of Jesus class, what I do, I found this out several years ago, and it's been an amazing experience that a lot of students don't necessarily express themselves best through prose, written word. And so I've told them, and I've already done this this semester, and it's really fun, but I tell them at the beginning of the semester, you've got two assignments. Number one, I want you to tell the story of Jesus as if you were there. So they have to write this one out. 
a first person account as if you were there and you can be creative you have to be consistent with the text but tell a story as if you were there and that's always fun to read they do this at the end of the semester the other one though they can't do until toward november or december but i asked them to express their understanding of jesus either in writing what does jesus mean to you now that you know him through this course or you can use some kind of artistic expression but if you do art, you have to give me a, an interpretation of it. So let me share a few of these. The ones I want to show you today are ones who students, when they began the semester, they did not believe in Jesus. And during the semester, they came to faith. The first one here, if you can, if you can see this, it's done in, it's about that size. But it's done in, um, in, in a, it, sort of a, a, a pasty pastel uh, medium. And so what the student did, not necessarily artistically beautiful, but here's Jesus on the cross, and he says, Jesus died to take my sins away. He personally bore the punishment I deserve for my sins. How can I not tell others why he offers them the same mercy? Now, this was a scholarship athlete. One of the things I'm most encouraged with is in the last 18 months at Lipscomb, we've gotten a lot more intentional about telling the story of Jesus, especially with our athletes, who many of whom have never been believers, and we've baptized over 70 of them in the last 18 months. And the coaches are very intentional about saying, you know, you're here to be formed for life, not just in the, in the particular athletic endeavor that you're in. We have different levels of involvement in that, but all the athletic teams have to be involved in mission trips now. And it's a wonderful thing to see the transition in their life. But this is an athlete, and what you can't see is on the body of Jesus, he took a pen, and on this pastel, he wrote in his personal sins, and when he gave that to me, I said, you know you're going to present this to the class, right? And I, he said, yeah. And I said, you really want to get that open about what you've struggled with? He goes, why wouldn't I? I'm not there anymore. Isn't it amazing that, you know, he, he doesn't have the inhibitions. He wants to tell the story. Uh, let's look at the next one. This is an interesting student who, okay, he's not necessarily artistically inclined, nor is he a good student. He was really having trouble taking tests. But, you know, he was trying to figure this out. Faith was a whole new experience for him. But this is the way he interpreted the semester. He said, those who died on the cross with Jesus, they merited their deaths. But Jesus' cross was different. He chose to die. The nails that held him there were my sins. So you see his cross is in the shape of nails. The blood of Jesus that flowed from his sin cleansed me from my sin. You think I'm going to be quiet about this? Do you think you passed the course? I think he did because he understood the, the, the powerful, transformative power of Jesus. Next slide, please. I love this one for what it has to say. Let's look at her explanation. She's a photography student. These are actually three by five pictures that are all put together in a collage. And she says, for me, Jesus is the sum total of my life. These are all snapshots I have taken of my family and important events of my life. They're a shaping story behind every one of these. When I stand back and look at them, I see Jesus so clearly. Thank you for letting me express my faith in this way. I never before have thought about such how true belief encompasses every moment of one's life. So I just I love this picture, the individual snapshots of your first order story. You stand back and look at them and see the shaping, framing story of Jesus. Uh, th this next one is particularly meaningful to me. This was a yellow ribbon student, meaning she was returning as a veteran of war and had, had some terrible experiences in war and um, never been in a church building in her life, had no interest in religion. And as she began to hear the story of Jesus, it gave her hope. And she said, how could I know that coming to Lipscomb, I wouldn't just find my career, I would find my life. And when she first painted this, this thing is huge. I still have it in my office. This is just the center part of it. I said, that looks like a sunset. You talk about this being a sunrise. And she said, be patient. I haven't had any, any light in my life for years. But I think that there is now light. And it's been wonderful to watch her over the last three years develop a deeper faith. Uh, the next one is just simply a student who has, uh, I wish I had more time to tell you her story, but she had just really a difficult situation of life. And she was a believer before she began. But just expressing her understanding that if God could create such beautiful uh, nature. Why should she have any concern about how he would take care of her life? And she's come to Lipscomb without any family support. She's somehow getting by on faith, but it's wonderful to see that kind of faith depicted. Um, next one is just simply a student who wanted to talk about the beauty of the cross, and we'll quickly, let's move on to the next one. This next one is pretty stunning to me. Here's when you know you've done something well as a teacher. When you give someone an assignment that they could do in 40 minutes, instead they spend two months. 
You know what the, do you know what micography is? I didn't know what it was. But Andrew Galea drew this. When he heard about this opportunity, he started early in the semester. There are no lines on this drawing. This is John 3, 16 and 17, written over and over and over again. So where you see the darker parts, he's written, written John 3, 16 and 17. You know, and this thing is the size of a poster. Do you know how long that took him? If you look real closely, you might see some of the words. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So you know you've done something as a teacher when you give an assignment that could take 40 minutes and they take two months instead. Probably my favorite one, though, is if you came to Lipscomb, you might meet Lizzie. Uh, she is a young lady who has cerebral palsy, amazing young lady in terms of what she can do and so limited in her ability to communicate. When I talked about this project, she literally squealed out loud because she had an opportunity to tell the class what she so desperately wanted to say. So if you can see these pictures, you see all the different elements in her life and you can see the idea of pain. And then she says, but the only thing that holds that together, and you can't see it because it's washed out in the middle, but you have the text from John that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. And what she wants you to see is, see the J-E-S-U-S, -S, only Jesus can make sense of the collage of my life. So I don't know what kind of art your life might produce, but I need you to hear these words of Jesus, so wonderfully translated in the message version of Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. And I want us to leave our assembly this morning with an understanding that what Jesus invites us to is not religion. He wants us to recover our life. So when he says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. There is a, an amazing place in Italy where I spent some time this summer in meditation. It's a place in Italy where I do some work. You can look it up on the internet if you're interested. It's called Le Scala di Redi Puglia. And what it is, it's a monument from World War I. The moment I told you about before when I was talking to three or 400 people in a large uh, um, oratorium talking to them about the story of Jesus. It, it, it was a new experience for me. And I've got to tell you that Pope Francis is doing some pretty amazing things in Italy. There's a rebirth in, in an interest in spirituality. He's telling everyone to read their stories, their scripture. He's telling them to read the gospels. And as I was speaking about the story of Jesus, I've never had an experience like this before, but I was interrupted by applause three or four times. And that's really unusual in Italy when you're talking about religion. But anytime I get to the idea of the kind of life that were offered in Christ Jesus, and I would say, are you interested in finding a life that is ultimately fulfilling? And it was like being at a soccer match. They started cheering and clapping. And so I got toward the end of it, and I told them this story that I'm about to tell you. They would have been familiar with it because it's a very famous place in Italy. But there are these mountain ste these steps that go up a mountainside in, uh, just outside of Redi Puglia or Monfalcone, Italy. And in those steps, it was the place of a great battle between the, the hun Hungarians and the, Australian, uh, the Austrians and the Italians in World War I. Uh, over 100,000 bodies are buried in those stairs. Only 30,000 of them have been identified. And so their names are engraved on these stairs that are about 12 feet tall. They go up this mountain. And then you have stairs you can walk up on the sides. And you think about the great price that was paid by the men who put their lives on line and are buried there because of what they believed in. But what struck me was on every one of those stairs where they have the names, at the top they have about an eight-foot letter. And it spells out on every step, presente. And that's the Italian way of saying, I'm present. When your name is called, if they say, like, it's ready for battle, if they called your name, presente. So the, the idea is, here are men who, when their names were called, they were present. But here's my question to you this morning. And I'll ask you the same question I asked them. And I didn't know what was going to happen, and I don't necessarily know what's going to happen this morning. But when you think about what God has called you to, to bear fruit for the good of the world, and you think about the fact that he's calling you by name, what I ask then, and I'm going to ask now, if you are ready and ready to participate and to give that which God gave you for the sake of making the world a better place, then I'm asking you to stand and say, present. So my question is, are you ready to participate in giving this world what it desperately needs? That's the message of Jesus. If you're ready, I want you to stand.
That's the same thing that happened in Italy. It's a story that will change the world. Let's pray. Loving God, here are your people. They are present. They are ready. They want to participate in your story. It's an amazing story of giving ourselves for the good of others. And ultimately, we celebrate that Jesus came to die on the cross to give us life. Now, Father, please, let each one of us, in the special way that you've created us, in our own personal stories, we have something to give. No matter where we are, no matter what condition we're in, physically, spiritually, you can redeem our lives, even in the most desperate situations. We can give of ourselves so that others may live. Father, I pray that we would abide in you in such a way that we've come to your table this morning. We have sung songs of praise to let the world know our names have been called and we are present. Through the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Can we all say present? Present. present. Yes. A couple of things occurred to me. Number one, I partially partially pay your salary. Since I now have a freshman in the Bible department at Lipscomb. Which which at this moment, for the first time since I wrote that first check, is very rewarding, amen? Um, To know that he will sit at the feet of you and others like you to bring that kind of an education to him is very rewarding. To be here today to sit at your feet is rewarding, not because of you, obviously, but because of you bringing us into a deeper walk with Jesus. We really, really appreciate it. And perhaps this morning you have some other need, a need that's not been met, something that's said that has caused you to want to look further, talk further. Our shepherds will be available right outside these doors, as always, to my right. Please take advantage of that if you would like to this morning. As we close these things, It is not too late to sign up for a small group. Those directories are still available in the lobbies and online. The men's fall retreat is scheduled for November the 14th and 15th. You can sign up starting today in the gym lobby. Member surveys. We've been doing a survey of the church to see where we are, what's going on. I hope that you've gone online or taken one of the hard copies. We have 57 back so far. We're looking for about 400, so we got a little ways to go. Thank you to those who have already done that. Please let us know by filling out that survey where you are and how you feel about things right now. Um, They have to be turned in by October the 12th, and you can still pick up a copy in the lobby if you don't want to do it online. Next week, Scott Sager will be here. Scott uh, has recently appointed Vice President of Church Services at Lipscomb University um, after 15 years serving as the pulpit minister for Preston Road in Dallas. So uh, be here for that time together again next week. Great, great day. I hope your day continues to be good and that you seriously consider a deeper walk that we shared about this morning so very, very well. Thanks for being here, and we will close in prayer. Have a great day. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you for the message this morning. We thank you for the reminder that we are yours, that we need to imitate Christ in our lives, that each person we come in contact must see Jesus in us. Help us this week as we go about our life and our walk, that we might shine the light to the world that it desperately needs. And Lord, just be with us as we go from this place. And Lord, come quickly, is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.